And then uh, last but not least, we'll let uh, David start about his discussion on developing and evolving your own optical or IP control plane. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is David Rosso. I'm a network systems engineer at Fastly. And now I'm going to be talking about developing and evolving your own control plane. So this talk is going to have three main parts. I'm going to uh, jump back to 2013 and explain uh, why and how we build our own control plane. Then I'm going to jump to 2015, and I'm going to detail a bit how we rethought our original control plane, and we started just trying to iterate on it. And then finally, we will go to early 2017, when we had already finished uh, designing our, our new control plane, and we were started working on, on a migration plan to go from the old to the new control plane. So without further ado, let's start. Let's go back to 2013. So in 2013, uh, the company was kind of in the early days. So we were setting requirements for the network infrastructure. So the first requirement was that we wanted to have multiple transits on each pop. Uh, that was mainly for uh, performance and reliability re uh, reasons. Like, you don't want to be just tied to a single uh, transit that has a bad day, and then all of a sudden your entire service is, is gone. The second requirement was that the company was fairly new, so it's impossible to predict usage or growth. So the, the architecture has, had to scale out horizontally with demand. And then finally, we have to connect those hosts to the network. And again, it's a fairly new company, so money is kind of a constraint. So we had to be able to connect all those hosts to all those transits in a cost-effective way. When you start thinking about connecting uh, to the internet, especially if you are thinking in connecting to multiple transits, and each transit has like its own uh, routing table, the first thing that comes to mind uh, are routers. However, routers are expensive. Uh, so if you don't have the money or you want to build a network that scales uh, economically reasonable, that's kind of a, a problem. Also, routers have a lot of bells and whistles that you might not care about, and those, all those features might lead to, to bugs that, OK, why is this broken? I mean, I'm not even using this, these features. And also, routers back in 2013, they were kind of limited to the best path forwarding or to policy-based routing, and I will get more into details later. Uh, so, so yeah, routers didn't look like a really good option for, them, for us. On the other hand, you, ha you have switches. Switches, they're super cheap. The port density is, is great, which means that you don't need that much space to, to rack them. They don't consume that much power which is good because that means that you can have even more servers in the rack. Uh, however, it has some uh, limitations. Like, for example, you cannot fit all those routes that you are going to be getting for your transits into, into the FIP. And also, back in 2013, switches only cared about IP and Ethernet, which means that if you want to start doing overlays or stuff like that, that's, uh, that's not a, an option. Uh, in 2013, the team were mostly comprised of two network engineers that were dealing with everything in the network, like from operations, provisioning, procurement. They were basically too busy to, to care about dealing with vendors and asking features and making sure that the vendor would implement them correctly. And we also had two software engineers, although one of them was the CEO, so arguably didn't count because he had better things to do. And they both had an open source background and hated network vendors <laughs> as a whole. And, and last but not least, they were determined to push the control of the network to the application. Like, usually you control the network from the network itself, like by setting policies or whatever. But we wanted instead to push that responsibility down to the application. So at this point, uh, the team came to the realization that routers are expensive and they don't do what uh, we want anyway because we want to push the responsibility to the application. They are super expensive and they are, yeah, their port density is not good. So not only CapEx is going to be bad, but OPEX is going to be bad as well because of power consumption, rack space, everything. Uh, on the other hand, switches are cheap. 
but they have certain uh, limitations. However, in 2013, there was at least one vendor, maybe two, uh, that were running Linux and would even give you access to program the switches uh, yourself. So we decided to build our own control plane. How hard can it be, right? Uh, I'm going to be hand waving some of the details now of that original control plane. You can visit that URL if you want to go more into details, but yeah, I'm going to summarize it a bit now. So we're going to be using this network just to illustrate how the original control plane uh, works. It's just a host, a switch, and two transits. So the first thing is that we have a layer three segment on each link going to the transits and another layer, layer three segment going from the switch to the, to the host. If we check the layer two and layer three uh, tables on the devices, there are no surprises, right? We have the FIP with the connected networks. We have the ARP table with the uh, neighbors on those networks. Nothing really surprising. Now we run IBGP down to the host which means that when a prefix comes in, we get those prefixes installed in the FIP of the host. However, remember that we are dealing with switches. We don't have space to put the full routing uh, tables of all those transits into the FIP of the switches, so we don't install anything on the switches. We just send them down to the, to the host. But what happens now? It turns out that the host now wants to send traffic to 172.20.01, right? So it just does, the host will do just a route lookup. It will see that it can send the traffic via those uh, two IPs, but it turns out that it doesn't know how to reach those IPs. You would traditionally solve this problem by running an IGP and having a recursive route lookup. Uh, however, Remember that the switch doesn't know how to reach 172.20.00/24, so you would use an IGP, you would be black holing traffic on the switch instead. So here's the trick. We put everything on the same layer two domain, transits, switches, and host. I know it's gross, but it works. Uh, now, you synchronize the ARP table from the switch to the host, you send all the ARP entries that belong to transit. So now, if the host wants to send traffic via the blue transit, the only thing it has to do is set the destination MAC address that corresponds to the router of that transit. And the switch will just do what it knows how to do best, which is switch traffic. And if the host wants to send traffic via the orange transit, it's just a matter of setting the corresponding uh, MAC address and now we can build tools like this one. This is an internal uh, ping tool that we have where we can actually ping a destination over all the available circuits on a given site. So you can see here we have like a bunch of circuits and we're pinging the same IP so we can see the latency and packet losses uh, for that particular IP over all the transits. So that was the original um, control plane. So now let's see how we uh, worked on it over the years as, as we gained experience and the, and the team grew. So uh, time passes and things are working fine, but the, it turns out that the old control plane had a few architectural shortcomings. I mean, unsurprisingly, layer, hacks, uh, layer two hacks don't scale well. And sharing layer two with transits has some minor issues. You have to start filtering broadcast traffic, which is not a big deal, but you have to remember to, to do. Uh, but more importantly, not having a clear separation between layer two and layer three is just confusing for people. Like this synchronizing our entries and not having a, a doing a recursive lookup, checking the ARP table instead of a connected route, that, that's just confusing for, for people. So we wanted to address uh, those issues. Also, the previous control plane didn't support IXPs. IXPs, per definition, they're already layer two domains, and you're not going to connect your own layer two domain with someone else's because that's just, just, just calling for, for disaster. So what we were doing with IXPs was to install routes coming uh, from peers in there into the FIB, which means that we were running into FIB limitations in uh, big IXPs like uh, AMSIX, DigX, Links, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, the state of networking in, two, in 2015 was pretty much the same as in 2013, but there were a few differences that changed uh, completely the game. The, it was the early days of segment routing on BGPLU, which uh, basically went very well with what we were doing. And switches started to have like more modern ASIC that could do uh, encapsulation protocols like MPLS or, or VXLAN. So that kind of was interesting for us. Now the team had grown quite a bit. We had now six network engineers still busy doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, but we have six software engineers to work on an actual solution that involved less hacking and more doing things properly. So now I'm going to be describing the new architecture. Uh, I'm going to be using this leaf edge network, uh, one host, two transits. So now we're, we have only point-to-point -point links. No more layer two shared between transits or multiple devices, only point-to-point -point links. Now, we run eBGP down to the host instead of IBGP. We assign an MPLS label for each egress peer. Any circuit that takes you out of the network has a dedicated uh, MPLS label. And we start MPLS on the host. So we're not only running BGP on the host, we are also running MPLS on the host. So now, if the host wants to send traffic via the blue transit, it only has to select the MPLS label corresponding to that transit. And if it wants to send it via the other transit, just put the other label. OK, so that was more or less an overview, but let's see a bit more in detail how it works. We first assign a label at provisioning time. So you provision a circuit that assigns the MPLS label. Now, Silverton, which was the control plane tool that before would propagate the ARP entries, now propagates the LSPs down the network. So every time that you provision any circuit, the label gets assigned on the edge, and Silverton just announces that down the, down the network. But here is the interesting bit. When a prefix reaches the edge of the network, via a particular transit, we tag with an extended community uh, that, pre that prefix um, with a community that identifies uniquely that LSP. So you can see, for example, those prefixes coming from two different networks. Each one is going to get assigned that extended community that identifies the particular LSP. And now on the host, we only have to extract the, the extended community and read which MPLS label to use in order to use that particular path. So now the network is super simple. It's just a bunch of MPLS routes, nothing else. You, you have MPLS label 1020. Just pop the label and send it this particular path. We don't have any more this layer 2 to layer 3 translation stuff doing weird things. Uh, this is just a route so I can show you how the community maps to labels. So we have a route coming from two different switches. We can see on the first switch how the extended community 8086.10.20 maps to the MPLS label 1020. And on the other hand, the other switch has the extended community 8086.10.24 that maps to the MPLS label 1024. So, Okay, now we have this network that is able to, uh, to send traffic via multiple transits uh, on a flow basis. So we need to expose that information somehow on the host so the application can make use of it. So the way we do that is we create a routing table for each particular egress peer. So here we have two different tables, and those tables, the only thing they have is a default route saying, if you want to exit this way, use this MPLS label. And then we just have a bunch of IP rules. This is a, a Linux construct that says, if the socket has the forwarding mark AE, do a lookup 
on this particular uh, table. If the forwarding mark is uh, 5.13, do a lookup on this other one. So if we want to send traffic via, I think this is Cogent, so if you want to send traffic via Cogent, for example, the application would just open a socket, put the option, uh, the forwarding mark option as AE, and that would cause the kernel to do a route lookup on that particular table that says, okay, you have to use this MPLS. And if the application doesn't know how to do this or doesn't care about this, you can always default to the uh, main table of the Linux host that will just have all the routes in there and then it's just a matter of writing BGP policies as, as usual. So uh, in retrospective, we managed to rebuild uh, the, the control plane using, uh, well, maintaining the nice features that we had in the previous one, which means uh, per flow routing, uh, while short, uh, addressing all the shortcomings of the previous one. And so far, everything has been work as expect, working as expected. Okay, so now we have two control planes. We have the old one and the new one. Um, so it's early 2017 and we want to work on a migration plan so we can migrate the old version of the control plane to the, to the new one. So we had a set of objectives for, for this migration plan. The first one is that we had to migrate from IBGP to eBGP because uh, IBGP is what the old control plane was using while eBGP was being used in the new one. And the main objective with this uh, migration was to make sure that we weren't running uh, multiple uh, control planes because that means that you have to maintain twice the code. You have to maintain twice the tooling as well. And you have to train people to be able to operate multiple uh, different networks. And then finally, I mean, if you have twice the things running in your network, it's just twice the things that can, can fail. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that this migration wouldn't take like years. Uh, so you have to migrate like 40, 50, pops, I mean, just between uh, finding uh, resources to do it, uh, notifying customer, uh, scheduling maintenance windows, I mean, that can take just forever. So we wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to be an issue. Um, but why is, why is it an issue? Uh, it turns out that migrating from IBGP to eBGP has a couple of problems. The first one is that if you're going to start changing ASs in your network, you have to synchronize them. If you don't make the changes at the same time uh, in all the involved devices, you're just going to bring down the, your network because, yeah, you have to have the local and the remote ASs uh, in sync on both sides or, yeah, or the session won't, won't come up. And also, IBGP and eBGP prefixes are not compatible when it comes to ECMP routing. So you have, like, these uh, three uh, routes that you can use, as soon as you migrate one of the devices to eBGP, that device is going to start attracting all the traffic because eBGP wins over IBGP, and that might cause some congestion issues upstream, which is bad. It's just going to disrupt the service. So how do you solve these problems? Well, you ask a traditional network architect, you're gonna basically get a doop, 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 doop. You can, you can basically do it. However, we have software engineers, and we just take RFCs with a pinch of salt. So we just hacked our way into this migration. So the first problem is the ASN migration, right? So this is actually easy to solve. We just uh, came up with a secondary AS keyword that basically says like, okay, if my neighbor is coming with either this or this AS, just accept it, simple as that. So now I can, only, I, I can just flip the local AS on one of the sites and the migration is done. Like I don't need to synchronize multiple devices at the same time. I can just do one change at a time. The second problem is a bit trickier is how do you make an IBGP prefix compatible with an eBGP one, so you can actually have both prefixes, both routes in the same ECMP route. So the first problem is that eBGP always wins over IBGP. So we developed this knob 
that says compare as IBGP, which basically says if a BGP session has this knob enabled, treat incoming prefixes as if they were IBGP when comparing against another uh, IBGP or EBGP prefix. So this is not a problem any longer for us. However, you're just moving the problem somewhere else because now it turns out that the AES path on the EBGP side is going to be longer because EBGP keeps prepending at each hop the, uh, the, the AES of the, of the router announcing it. So we develop this other knob that says skip private AES path prefix, which basically what it does is when computing the length of the AES path, ignore all the leading uh, private AESs. So now because the leading AES in the AES path is 65,000, that's just going to be ignored. So the, the length of both uh, prefixes are just going to be the same. And then finally, we were using uh, local pref to signal various things in the, in the network, and EBGP doesn't transport uh, local preference. Uh, so we just added another knob to, to be able to transport local pref between EBGP speakers. So now that we have all these knobs, the migration process is as simple as, as follows. During the step one, you just enable the secondary AES that you want to accept and all the other knobs. Compare as IBGP, skip, private AES path prefix, allow BGP, local pref. And this change is completely innocuous. It has no impact whatsoever. So you can just, you can just deploy it everywhere without any maintenance whatsoever. And then step two is just as simple as flipping the local AES on each device. And because we made eBGP and IBGP prefixes compatible, this change is going to cause a BGP session to flap, but it's not going to cause any traffic to, uh, to flow differently. When the session is up, all traffic will flow as it was flowing before doing this change. So thanks to this, we don't need to start scheduling maintenances, uh, draining traffic, uh, notifying customer, because the change is not going to have any impact on the network. Uh, here is an example. Uh, we have this prefix that is coming from two different switches. Uh, one of them is an IBGP uh, speaker, the other one is an, an eBGP speaker. You can see that the uh, AES path is completely different. The eBGP one is way, way longer. And you can see that the local pref is being transported as well on the, on the eBGP speaker. So finally, thanks to all the knobs, uh, we have this ECMP route that is taking into account both uh, next hops, not only one. So yeah, so now I have a few closing remarks. Pretty sure that now you're thinking if we consider this or that. Uh, so I have a few preemptive slides. The first one: Did you consider OpenFlow? Well, <laughs> just gonna let the GIF play a few times. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna make any comment. <laughs> did you consider segment routing? So we did. Uh, segment routing. The core ideas are are great. I actually like segment routing a lot. Um, Main problem for us is that segment routing was super complex for what we wanted to do. I mean, we just wanted to do uh, egress peer selection. So, like 99% of the features of uh, segment routing doesn't, that didn't. I mean, they didn't really apply to us. It also solves half the problem. Like segment routing kind of still keeps the control of the of the path in the network, either via a BGP controller or via uh, policies. And we wanted to. To, to push the, the control to the, to the application. So it didn't really uh, map that well with what we wanted to do. And also, there was no open source option. And for us, I mean, we, don't, we, we have a few developers, but we don't have all the resources to develop everything that segment routing uh, entails. I don't even think that any vendor actually supports segment routing yet, at least on a, not in a GA manner. Um, BGPLU, so this is interesting. This, maps a bit better to what we are doing. Uh, however, it has the same problem as segment routing as, as it keeps the, the decision of how to route traffic on the, on the network. And again, we wanted to push it down to the, 
to the to the application. Although I think it's the right thing to do, and we might in the future revisit the solution and maybe implement BGPLU at least to transport the the information about MPLS, which we do today with the communities. But that has a few complexities. There is no open source implementation for BGPLU. And the trick with uh, BGPLU is that you require a new address family. And you have to synchronize both address family because BGPLU requires you to do uh, a recursive lookup to know how to reach the next hop of the route that you got via the regular IPv4, IPv6 address family. So yeah, you have to start dealing with uh, race conditions. So it's a bit more complex to, to implement. And yeah, to summarize everything, we built what we built in 2013 because there was nothing better. Uh, routers were super expensive. Uh, switches had certain limitations, so we had to work with them, uh, and that meant doing all these horrible layer two hacks. Uh, having the custom control plane was critical because we saved a lot of money and time, and it also allowed us to attract talent. When you have this cool solution, it's easier to hire people than when you're just doing things as, as usual. And then finally, we just revisited the solution when the team was larger and there was less uh, hardware constraints so we could build something, something better. We finally hacked our way into this seamless migration, which is, makes a lot of a difference. And open source was critical because without open source, we couldn't have uh, pulled this off because resources would have been uh, an issue. And this is everything. If someone has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So, yep. Yep. Uh, Ryan, data link, Inquisitor, and Witchburner. Um, you mentioned your last slide, you saved a bunch of time and money. Can you quantify that? I mean, that's four years of development and that's software development salaries. You know, how much did you actually save by doing this? So with time, I mean uh, time in getting things done. Like if you need a new feature and you have a traditional vendor, how long does it going to take? It's going to take a year. You have to open, you have to talk with your SE. You have to make sure that they get it in the pipeline. Then they have to develop it. Then you have to upgrade all your network so you have that new feature. So saving time, I mean, we control our own uh, software so we can just develop it and deploy it and we have the feature already. And money, well, I mean, if you have like, I don't know, like 2,000 network devices and each one costs like $20,000 compared to $500,000, it's an easy math. <laughs> Uh, Matt Petak, Yahoo, this sounds really great. Now, I couldn't help noticing that you uh, took some of our, our learnings from the past 20 years about BGP and sort of said, well, you know, um, worrying about loops and things like that really isn't necessary in this case, so we're going to ignore things like AS path length and we're going to change around the, the route priorities. In your simplistic diagram here of just kind of the why of yeah. A, B, and host, it looks fairly straightforward. Did you have any situations where the tweaks you were doing caused any uh, potential loop situations or unexpected, why are my packets going that away instead of this away? Yeah, so we're ignoring the AESs, the leading AESs, for the sake of computing the length. So we're still doing the regular uh, prevention loop Oh, so, so you didn't just completely throw them away. They're still being considered. You yeah. just truncate yeah, yeah. the length. Yeah, it's just right. when computing the length. So like, just ignore them now that you're counting them. But then when you are checking them to make sure that you don't have a loop, you still uh, use them. OK, thank you. Me? Oh, sorry. Uh, I guess I have it. Uh, Dan Mahoney, ISC, over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, it looks like you're using a lot of mainline bird. Have any of those changes made it back into the mainline? So we, we have upstreamed everything, uh, both in the kernel, because we had to do a few kernel changes for, the, um, for supporting MPLS on the, on the host. But everything has been uh, submitted to the respective upstreams. BERT hasn't approved yet all the patches, but they are there. So you can 
either press them to accept them or just download them and apply them yourself. Excellent, thank you. Hi, David. Um, I'm Ernesto. By the way, awesome projects um, all the way back from to the Spotify SIR pro uh, project. Thank you. Um, my question is, in regards to your, one of the things that you address here is kind of peering engineering on the egress. So do you support um, for the same destination prefix um, sending traffic to more than one interface? And if not, then how do you address um, the situations where a certain prefix attracts a lot of traffic on one interface, so when you switch from one to the other, that's a lot of uh, traffic shift. So this is for, for egress, right? Like if traffic is being sent from the transit provider to us, there is nothing we can do there uh, with this solution. It's just a matter of AS path prepending, met, changing, blah, blah. And regarding supporting, uh, sending traffic to the same IP via different uh, transits, that's the whole point of this. So you can, you can send traffic, like that was the ST ping example that I showed where you're pinging to the, to the same IP via all the circuits at the same time. So you can get uh, metrics in real time over all of them. Okay, and there is a feedback loop in terms of utilization as well, or I missed that part? Uh, well, I mean, the bandwidth utilization, you mean? Yeah. Is, is, that, is that part of the considerations? Uh, well, that's kind of a different topic. Like, that tool is just a, a wrapper around ping to be able to ping around uh, through all the, all the um, circuits. Uh, but you could, you could start measuring things and taking that into account so the application could decide which one to, to use. But that's kind of like a more like a congestion control mechanism, I guess. So it's kind of out of scope of this particular tool. Okay, thank you. Um, so Linux is an, an Linux and MPLS stacks are, oh, that sounds weird, don't exactly the most high performance stack there is. Did you guys figure workarounds or what? Uh, performance wise? It's no problem whatsoever. You have no issue? I mean, we, we have been measuring things, and we get exactly the same throughput uh, with IP, or like regular IP and MPLS. Like, for us, it was, I mean, we were, that's the reason why we actually used MPLS. We were evaluating VXLAN uh, instead of MPLS. But the thing is that the NICs that we had didn't support uh, hardware offloading for VXLAN, but they, they did for MPLS, which meant that we could do uh, MPLS without losing any performance whatsoever because it's done in the NIC. Oh, so you, your NIC support MPLS software? Yeah, you can actually see, like there were at the very beginning a few performance is issues, but those were just uh, bugs in the kernel. So you can see the first two links that are actually going to kernel.org. Yep. Those are the, the bug fixes actually making sure that performance-wise they behave exactly as uh, regular IP. Oh, cool, nice, thanks. Uh, Joel Yegley, Fastly. Um, just one comment on that. Um, I think uh, one of our experiences with this was actually that uh, the stuff is substantially better than it was two years ago, um, which is, uh, I think, a big improvement with respect to MPLS performance. So the, con the inclusion of the stuff in the kernel has actually uh, improved uh, since early, the early era of it, and it's now tolerable. Also, TOE uh, helps when it works, and it doesn't always, but it's still acceptable without it, still at this point. Gaurav Davra, Cisco Systems. I'm just curious how many labels you have to support on the host? So today we're doing only one, uh, because we, do, we use it only for egress uh, path selection. We assign globally unique uh, labels to each uh, circuit. So today we only need to do, to do one. We're going to start soon uh, testing with two just uh, to see how it works. But today we're just doing one. OK. Well, thank you.